All right, welcome back to another episode of Four Insight. I'm your host, Mike Ovi. Joining me today is a person I've known for quite a while, one of the greatest minds I've been around and I've been able to experience. So we're going to pick a brain today. <laughs> Without further ado, Mallory Colbert, how are you doing today? I'm good. How's it going? Not bad, not bad. Just another day and just trying to bring this content to the people and try to learn as much as I can as well for myself. Nice. How are things on your end? They're pretty good. I've been chilling, living with my sister. So that's been fun. It was my first like Christmas because like my parents used to celebrate Christmas when I was a kid and they stopped when I was like four because that's something that their church does. Yeah. And so this is my first like Christmas that I can really remember. So it's been fun. No, it's great. Absolutely. And family and just being able to at least have someone to spend Christmas with. I know a lot of people with the times we're living in, you know, not able to do so. So it's great to have at least someone to chill with and experience. All righty. So let's let's uh, let's start. I always like to start off with some background. So um, just for the people who don't know who you are, just give a bit of a, a synopsis of who Mallory Colbert is and what you do. Yeah. So, oh, my goodness, that's so funny. I, cause I feel like I've changed so much and like just done so many different things. It's hard to define myself, I think, by like my work even but let me give like a little overview of just like the things I've been up to so after I graduated with my sociology degree uh I kind of was I mean I'm still pre-med but I transitioned into healthcare just like working as a medical assistant and stuff like that and while I was there did a bunch of like it was at a nonprofit, but since we kind of closed down for the pandemic, mm. I spent my time split between doing community like philanthropy projects. Like I distributed some COVID masks, um, over a thousand actually, which was really cool. Mm. And um, like learning how to code. So now I'm a data engineer, <laughs> so I'm no longer a medical assistant. And I guess I could kind of just describe myself as someone who doesn't take no for an answer and like see something and just goes for it kind of after some I, I will say deliberately calculated I will say like I'm not I don't just like rush into things <laughs> <laughs> definitely like just I'm a go-getter that's just how I live my life <laughs> no for sure that's one of the things I've always respected about you uh, is just your deliberate and you know nonsense approach and you know you're one of the people like you say go-getter and just when you have your mind set on something, you've always been one to kind of take action towards it. So that's really admirable. And it seems like that's never changed about you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's like a core like value. I don't even know. It's like in there somewhere, someplace I can't change it. <laughs> yeah, and that's great to have. That's something a lot of people lack. So uh, just first thing, what we're going to start off is like we kind of already have talked about, despite the challenges that 2020 gave us, you know, with the pandemic and COVID and having to deal and navigate with that, we're now at the end of 2021. So it's been a whole year of kind of things getting back to normal, opening back up. Um, just looking back at how 2020 was and then now getting to the 2021, what would you say has been uh, just your experience in this times? Ooh. It's really funny because I feel like, like, of course, you know, the pandemic has been super impactful, Mm -hmm. but I think one of the even bigger things, or maybe like not bigger, but something that kind of layered on top of it, um, everyone, I mean, in the US, I guess, kind of focusing on like anti-Blackness and like racism. Mm -hmm. And I think that the pandemic and like... (sighs) I mean, I'll just like kind of this like peaking of documented police killings, you know, or police murders uh, really kind of motivated me to be to do all this extra work that I had been doing, like in my community, mm-hmm. not extra work, work community work, uh, especially because like, like I said, my last job, um, I kind of started during the pandemic. And so I had so much time to focus on these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I started kind of doing like anti-racist work and stuff at my job, which they didn't love. <laughs> but they're they, don't not- like the truth. they don't like the truth coming out. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's hard to acknowledge, especially because it takes you sort of acknowledging some of the demons of the past. And so, yeah, definitely acknowledging, you know, sort of the racial plight that's in this country and just the disparities is something that 
um, it's slowly becoming a conversation It's slowly being acknowledged, but definitely a lot of work is needed to be done. Yeah, absolutely. I think also, yeah, I think especially given all of like these murders being so publicized, I think that a lot of people think that because they're not doing that, that they're doing enough, you know, like they're yeah. like, oh, well, I'm not like murdering black people in the street. So I'm not racist kind of deal. And I think that gave people too much leeway, um, like to feel good about themselves when they're not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And so I definitely have been told that I'm a person who like, quote unquote, pushes people before they're ready. And people kind of like come back to me and they're like, oh shit, like you were right. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, and so that's exactly how it was at my last job. So <laughs> yeah. and you did it within your job space too. That's, that's risky, but that's again, something that people can respect because you actually were able to put your money where your mouth is. A lot of people don't want to, you know, sort of take on the risk of, hey, I'm going to talk about these issues that are, you know, affecting people who look like myself. They rather just say, eh, is it worth it? No, I don't think so. You know, so like for me, um, I think the one thing is that people weren't able to hide from it anymore, you know, because you're sitting in your home, you're actually having to watch it unfold. You can't ignore it. You can't turn away from it because it's everywhere you look you, like there's no, oh, I did. I wasn't aware. There's none of that ex excuse anymore. So I think it really kind of showed people's colors. Like, do you really say that you back, you know, people who don't look like you, people of color, pe minorities in general, do you really say that you support them like you do? And if you do, then what are you doing? Where's the action? Or are you just someone who says it because it helps you uh, with your bottom line, it helps you with your business? You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of that type of uh, sentiment and those type of actions, beliefs um, are getting exposed from people. Yeah. And like, I'm never the kind of person who's going to be like, you're just a terrible person, like end of like, go die like I <laughs> will sit there and like especially if someone is my friend or like I'm close to them like I'm not gonna like let you walk around being stupid <laughs> like yeah. I'm gonna tell you what's up and like that's out of respect out of love you know like it's not me being like I don't even know just like asserting myself over someone and I think that especially when it's at your job and the people you're telling this to are like your boss you know mm. <laughs> like mm. it's it's just totally a different ball game and I really was like lucky that I was able to like just had the I guess the means to not really I mean I cared if I got fired but I was also such a toxic work environment that like I mean I was gonna quit you know yeah exactly like, yeah. yeah for me it was one of those things like I, I would I always say that like I grew up around the spectrum like the full like as conservative, you know, Republicanism as you can get. I've grown up around that. I've grown up around liberal Democrats, you know, that's on the political basis. But bottom line, I've been able to see both sides. So then I've kind of had to be the bridge and sort of like, why do people think this way? Or why is it such a issue? And I've actually am able to kind of talk and have those conversations with people. So that was sort of my role that I took on. It's like, people were literally like, why don't people do more? Or why don't people care enough and I'm like well you know x y and z a lot of it is people you know have been able to be blissfully ignorant on one end and then uh, on the other it's like people don't feel like their actions really are going to have any sort of benefit any sort of impact so then they kind of get tired right there's a sort of fatigue that happens where it's like we try we try we keep getting told to have patience and then nothing is done so people kind of you know either build resentment or they take on more um what's the word, volatile steps, you know, as, as a result. So that's sort of one of the things that's been interesting on my end is just being able to have those conversations and being able to be a sort of a, a voice of reason in a way, you know. Yeah, but that's such a role to take on too. Like, it was really hard for me to kind of walk that line between like, what am I getting like paid for, you know? <laughs> what am I getting like praised for? Like, what am I seeing that's having a benefit? And like, and then like, you know, that feeling of like, I'm never, I'm not doing enough, you know, for my community. I'm not doing enough for like people. Mm. And it's always just like, you can't, you can't do things for people if you have no capacity, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you have to refresh, you have to be able to draw those boundaries to make sure you're not swallowed up whole, you know? 
Yeah, absolutely. And you can't let it uh sort of weigh down on you too much. It's like you can affect one person at a time. And that's that's more than, you, you know, some of the other people are doing. You just have to take it a day by day approach. If you try to cure the world in one day, you're not, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure, you know. Yeah. And it's so important to also be like mindful of your because it's like I didn't notice how stressed out I was, like how like my body was reacting, you know, mm. like I was like sick and I just kind of felt like it was like my new normal. So I didn't really think much of it. And then when I left that job where I was like super stressed out all the time, mm. like I had all these other stresses too. Like I, you know, was going to have to like pay my rent and stuff and like be unemployed. But like the fact that my body had like had healed like mm. I was able to like do things and it wasn't so draining and I just like it's so important to be mindful of how things are affecting you because sometimes you just don't even notice yeah absolutely you know? especially mentally like at least like when someone is sick that's a physical manifestation but I think part of the reason why mental health is such a, a controversial topic is like you can't really see someone's brain being stressed it's just something that they feel well, stress to one person may look different than stress than another person, but those are the real things that people are having to deal with, right? And that those are real stressors. And a lot of it is, you know, the weight of the world is sort of being uh, bestowed on their brain. And it's just like, like, you're just tired, like you're just fatigued, you're just worn down. And then that affects everything else in life. But being able to sort of get away from those experiences, get away from that environment, you realize like, dang, I'm actually, I was actually really, you know, harming myself really like there was some serious illness going on. And so it's always, you know, one of those things that people have to be mindful of, like you said. Yeah, definitely. All right. So let's talk about upbringing Houston, Houston lady, Houston girl. And then, uh, you know, both uh, have that in common. So just talk about your formal years leading up to college before you uh, started um, your path on adulthood. Yeah. Ooh, interesting. I, I don't know. Like, I feel like I've always just been like a super weird kid. I also recently, like this year, speaking of like 2021 transitions, I found out like all of my like brain things, not like brain, like neurological so much, but like finding out that I have like ADHD, finding out that I am autistic, like all these like random things. Um, Oh, sorry. I'm like at my sister's. I just want to make sure her dog doesn't start. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. <sighs> but yeah, so I guess like all those things had been affecting me, you know, in my upbringing. I just didn't know. Uh -huh. um, so I always kind of felt like the odd kid out. I was like, I always thought I was so weird. Um, over overestimating how weird I was, I think, definitely. Um, hmm. My parent, I'm also the youngest child, I will say. So, like, my sister got like the brunt of our parents' parenting. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, she never forgets to remind me that, like, oh, yeah. I'm the baby and I got all like the, the good stuff. Apparently, it trickles down. So, um, my parents like were really just like chill and and wanted me to be happy. Mm. And I think part of that was like making sure I had the skills I needed like soft skills really like I guess learning how to talk to people and understanding my own kind of worth you know mm. yeah. they very much instilled that in me wanting me to feel like I was a good person like my parents are very pro-black and like <laughs> they wanted to make sure that I didn't feel like I was like less than a person just because I was black growing up in this predominantly white area or it was not so much anymore but mm. yeah I think I definitely like that was so important my parents instilling that confidence in me to be able to grow and having like a secure kind of like home base mm. where like I could branch out and you know if something was wrong I could like, crawl back home if I really <laughs> <you know? laughs> No, all that is no, all that's good and it's important. It just sort of at first off, you know, finding out, you know, the kind of person you are, right? I think a lot of people struggle with that sort of uh, identity and finding their identity first off, and then uh, just understanding family dynamics and understanding how your parents are, right? A lot of the way our parents raise us uh, forms how we see the world, our worldview when we become adults, right? And I think uh, people don't really understand 
uh, like my parents treated me this way. They, you know, raised me this way. They cultured me this way. And this is part of, you know, either why I choose to believe in certain ideals or reject them. So I think just finding that is important and uh, kind of vital in a person's development. Um, now, as far as activities, you know, when you got to, you know, say like middle school, high school, I know you cheered. I remember we talked about that. But other than that, what were some of the other things you were into? I was a big writer. I wanted to be a writer. I like had all my my novels, you know, my little young adult fiction novels, basically. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> always probably doing it, you know. Um, oh my god, <sighs> I'm just thinking about all the times, like, like I loved to write, right? But like, I couldn't do deadlines. I was like very ADHD, like, <laughs> but I didn't know it was not managed. Like, I remember all the little. I don't know if you could call this cheating. What I will say is like, you know, when you had to turn something in and we were using flash drives, which was great. I would just like corrupt the file and be like, oh my God, like it's not working. They'd be like, it's fine. Just get it to me when you get home. So I got like all this extra time and like figuring out how to like accommodate myself, I guess, <laughs> was like very helpful. You know, I kind of like figured out how to like live <laughs> that was a hot yeah. for sure. kind of just like trying to like I don't know just like make my own life better in like small ways definitely a hobby and then I like I said I was a writer so I like to write about like tv shows and stuff and like just kind of like analyze them like a big one was Avatar The Last Airbender and that definitely yes, yes, yeah yes. but that's that's my shit um my that my show, <laughs> right like it definitely <laughs> especially because it came out it's such like a you know it was like what like eight nine I don't know and it was just so they tackled so many heavy themes and they made it palatable to children yeah. and that stuck with me and just like learning about colonization and just different family values even like thinking about like Prince Zuko and how like his poor sad family but yeah right. anyway <laughs> yeah and juxtapose prince zuka with the zula like uh you know it was during the pandemic i remember it they dropped it on netflix and it was so like i had just watched the whole series over again i found it and then it was all these people talking about it on twitter and they were analyzing it and i'm like like it always hits home differently as an adult when we're actually able to go through life and it's like bro this this show is relatable no wonder it was good you know because you could like see like okay prince zuko and how he was raised and how his dad treated him how his mom treated him and then you flip that with like azula and how she was complete opposites and then you wonder why they had the views of themselves that they did the image you know uh conflicts that they had and then you had you know this guy like ang who you know was basically but like you're responsible for the entire world at age 12 figure it out you know and then you know you lose everything you have a uh, let's see who it was Katara and I don't I don't want to do a whole show breakdown but it's just there's a lot of layers to that show that I think that's why it hit home for so many people it's like it's so relatable it's so relatable and it's like it's relatable like the underlying concept for sure and then you have different ways that it's expressed you know because you know obviously the show isn't in, in 21st century America right and I just think that's really interesting to see like because you feel a common thread, not so much see it, I guess. Yeah. And I think that's really important for like just building community generally. But like, and then the way they showed those, like these, these harrowing themes, like I just cannot believe I was introduced to the concept of colonization, like <laughs> in this children's show. And that like, like it really stuck with me, which is the reason I actually studied sociology because like I didn't even know you could study stuff like that, like yeah. human interaction with these big institutions like like capitalism and how the fire nation was basically just an allegory for the united states you know what i mean <sighs> like just polluting. oh no <laughs> <laughs> she said it she said it. oh wow <laughs> right? but they just go and they have all these machines completely disregarding the like earth and all these amazing ways people interact with it to because they don't want to interact with it so much as they want to just take it over and yeah. use it for their own gain. And that ooh, just realizing that that's like an undercurrent of things. That was just so wild. I'll that never was like my first. Yeah. I'll never forget. Brizuko said it. 
the fire growing up we were taught that the fire nation was the greatest civilization ever known to man what an amazing lie that was the world doesn't admire us they hate it and i'm just like dang because <laughs> people kept <laughs> people kept clipping that and kept posting it and they were like america 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 i'm like mm -hmm. I mean, hey, when the truth comes out, people will show you. And so it's like, you know, and, and again, and this isn't a anti anything. It's just like us observate, like us observing, you know, just sort of the world and uh, the way we grew up and how the impact of one show, you know, from our childhood really is kind of translated to today and just seeing how the parallels and kind of foresh foreshadowing, you know, just all these things that have happened. But so going back so first off sticking on the writing point so who are some of the people who like if there are anybody who kind of inspired you or influenced you as far as the stuff that you wrote about other than the shows Ooh. i i mean i will say maybe not influence so much as like because i i was definitely like just ripping off TV shows that I had seen and like spinning them, you know what I mean? Like as a like a kid kid. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I don't even maybe like the music I listen to, mm. but I don't I don't think like any individual people so much. I think my biggest supporter was definitely my mom though, because she was an English teacher, like for she was a third grade like ELA teacher. And mm -hmm. um she would always like read my work, you know, and edit it and stuff and like give me feedback. And it was nice always having that. And then like, she also taught at my school. So like I had kind of the support of other like English teachers, you know, and yeah. they definitely hyped me up. Who knows if my writing was actually that good, you know? <laughs> it was like, just like being around my mom and her like circle of friends. They were always just like, wow. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I always, always observe that like classmates of mine who had like parents that were teachers as well, always seemed to have a, deep level of insight as far as just education as far as school as far as it like they always tended to do well they always were on top of things and so I mean again it makes sense that when you have a, a parent that's in education usually you take it pretty seriously or you're on top of things and so it was always good to be friends with those type of kids because you know you really got to tap into sort of their mindset and their parents mindset and how they were able to sort of take things seriously and uh take care of stuff too so it was always interesting yeah, and it was also like having that kind of like almost objective understanding of myself because I was getting it externally so often. Mm -hmm. I think that's like when I kind of started to question just like how things were run, you know, um, just because like like stuff like we had to do our like reading logs, you know, and we had to get them signed off by our parents. Oh. And, right and so my thing was I was reading all the time like and I would just forget to have my mom sign it you know and so just like the way that the education system is really not good for most people like learning wise I'm like that was all about punishment like them being like you didn't read all of this because your mom didn't sign it kind of thing and I was like but that's not like what happened? they systemized <laughs> they systemized us it, it's not oof, oof, exactly. oof, oof, oof. i have so many opinions on the education system i mean they they in my opinion our education system here just needs like a reboot or a revamp like the modern like one thing I, I see is that modern kids and i think we were like this but really these uh young these young people who technology is like part of them right they ha there hasn't been this catch up to the sort of the short term mindset in terms of thinking and like young kids aren't dumb in terms of like they can see okay this isn't really productive like this is just kind of training us to be a part of a system right mm -hmm. and and i'm not really having my mind stimulated and as a result you have kids who they, they can't think the way you know like our system is set up so then they think oh, i'm inadequate or i'm dumb it's like no you just think differently because then you you talk to them and it's like oh wait this kid's actually really intelligent you know or this kid actually has a deep level of thinking it's just the way he sees the world isn't the way that it's taught to him but you're told eh, well if you don't do it this way then you're never going to be anything and i think that's just unfortunate but oof, i can i can go into that well that's something that's another podcast no but you're so right like the education system especially because it's something it's one of the few things that the united states government actually like mandates you know yeah. and like has standards for every single person is supposed to meet these mm -hmm. the fact that it is implemented so poorly 
just, I mean, you can see it in our youth, you know what I mean? Like yeah. people are so disenfranchised and just, dis, I, I want to say disheartened. Yeah, no, that's the word. Yeah, and they don't want to like, they don't want to participate and they shouldn't have to participate in something that is so just, I mean, it's just not working for them, you know? It's yeah. unequal, it's not well put together. And I mean, even, you know, education workers, like teachers underpaid, you know? For unable sure. to unionize in a lot of states. Yeah, and I mean, like, I think the one thing is whenever I keep hearing like kids say, what is me being in school? How does it benefit me? It's like, well, there are some things, but those are, those those core values aren't being taught or those things aren't being highlighted. It's just, okay, you get up, you go, you get told what you're supposed to do, and then you go home. It's like, mm -hmm. train. That's, that's basically training someone to be a worker. You go to work, you get told what to do, you do it for eight hours a day, then you go home, you do some assignment that you were assigned, and maybe you learn something, maybe you don't, but as long as you meet my deadlines, you know, you keep on moving. You know, that's the thing. And it's, uh, I'm just like, there needs yeah. to be an evolution, you know what I'm saying? Because not everyone thinks the same way. Not everybody has the same, you know, worldview, same goals. Not everybody, you know, gets uh, cultured the same way too. So um, like for me, where I take it further is priorities, right? If someone grows up impoverished and their priority isn't necessarily going and taking care of some assignment, but rather, you know, like I have to go out and work and bring home food for my family, what's really going to take priority me feeding my family me feeding myself or me you know doing some assignment that I really don't care for you know what I'm saying and then those people get labeled as oh they don't care those are absentee students those students are aloof it's like no they just have different priorities you know as opposed and to somebody like your job is to make their priority school you know yeah yeah or or like to be able to coach them and be able to see that okay this kid maybe thinks a little differently or maybe this kid has different challenges and there are teachers and coaches even who uh, who have that ability but it's not enough of them to do it for everybody you know exactly and so then those kids end up getting left behind and you know, i think that's the one part of it that um is missed and it's unfortunate it is really unfortunate and it's really funny like i i always forget about this but i remember when i was in high school i wanted to drop out and like <laughs> my, obviously my parents were not having it they were actually like my parents because i told them i was like i like i was basically like i don't feel like i'm being challenged and then i feel like like i don't know how to explain it uh definitely a former gifted kid you know like just feeling like i'm not challenged and then like i am not having my needs met at school um mm. And I, my parents were like, well, you can drop out if you can find like something else to do basically. And I, wow. I couldn't, um, <laughs> not without like significant like investment, you know, I actually wanted yeah. to have like, a skincare company. And yeah. yeah, I remember you talked to me about that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess sticking on that point, what, I know you said that you don't feel like you're being challenged. So what do you think could have been something that like would have benefited you that would have made you feel more invested in school because I think most of the times like I think a lot of kids I know kids I had teammates even who were like you know like you and um I was able to talk to them and it's just not even it's not a disinterest it's like a boredom it's like mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of this experience so what were some of the things that could have been done that maybe would have had you buy in a little bit more um to be honest, I think that having more black teachers would have been really helpful. I think mm. that like being at the school where like, I mean, all the teachers were white, you know, and like for Ben, like Sugarland, you know, it's not like a predominantly white area. So I think it's really oh. weird that like the teachers and stuff are overrepresented. Like they're just white women mm -hmm. um, mostly. And like, I just feel like the, I could feel the way that they saw me, like, as soon as I did something wrong, like, it was like, that's a problem kid kind of thing. And it's just like, like, maybe they wouldn't say it, but it was like, I just remember having like parent teacher conferences and stuff. And like, afterwards, my parents just kind of being like, yeah, you're fine. Like, don't feel like you are the problem here. And like, I was just kind of like agreeing about that. <laughs> and they were just like, sorry, like you, you might have either you're going to drop this class or you're going to like, um or we can like switch teachers kind of deal but like just the education system was just not very warm and welcoming I think that they would always kind of have these big expectations for me because I would show promise like at the beginning of the year and then lose interest because it was mm. like just like random shit I'm like I don't even know but I remember teachers being like I'm like disappointed in you and I was like 
for what <laughs> you know because... and just like, not being clear as to like how I could really be successful especially like in high school they kind of just throw you to the sharks as soon as you start doing like honors classes yep um, they don't they don't really not coddle you but they don't really like walk you through stuff and I'm like I'm, I'm a kid you know like yeah. I'm not an adult just because I'm taking an honors or like AP class I still need to be told what to do how to do it um and I'm not spending all of my time at home doing this because I I'm in sports and stuff you know like I have a life I had a job I had I was on cheer team mm. I was captain for two years like I don't have time okay captain <laughs> I'm hold and learn something that I should have been taught in school I think but also just generally being respectful of other people's needs because I feel like kids would be pretty obvious about it even if they couldn't explicitly say that mm. something was a problem for them yeah um, but teachers were rarely willing to accommodate they would kind of just be like try harder and it's like mm -hmm. trying isn't the issue here you know there's something there's some disconnect between my effort and the end product and I need help figuring out what that is and really that's only accessible for people whose parents could afford tutors and stuff like that or you had to like <sighs> stay at school extra long get there early leave late so you could be a two like oh, what is it tutoring hours whatever like uh -uh. <laughs> that is just so much of an extra investment that I should have been getting in class, you know? Oh, my goodness. Ah, man, this is fire because there's so much, <laughs> like, this is really, like, a lot of what I think and what a lot of people think. I, I had a unique advantage and kind of perspective because I moved. And so coming from where I was, it's, it wasn't far, but there was a clear, clear difference, which was that, like, I grew up in a small town, first off, that was growing and that was emerging, that was diversifying. But when it started, it was all PWI institutions. I, I remember I'd only be like the one black person most of the time in my classes. Now, I knew how to blend in, quote unquote. So mm -hmm. that was really never a thing until like I got older and started to see it like be manifested. But I say all that said, when I transferred and when I moved to like Sugarland, Missouri City area, there was a growing diversity or, or like most of my classes were diverse and we had some black teachers, but I could see like, most of the kids were actually smart and really intelligent because of like their parents being successful. They bestowed those uh, sort of ideals onto them, but it, it was a lot of kids who kind of just did their own thing and just was like, I'm bored. I don't really feel like doing this work. They get it done like on their time, but it's like, I have different priorities. Like I'm thinking about different stuff or like, you know, like those kids tended to goof off and like teachers would label them kind of as a nuisance or as distracted or as distractions. And I'm like, well, you're just not stimulating them. Like they're literally bored, like, because they're like, they, they're already thinking way past this. Like they're, they're, they're thinking, okay, what is this going to do for me? Like long-term or how, what am I learning today? That's going to impact me tomorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, most of it is stuff like building good habits, building discipline, you know, that's sort of the thing like I took away from like school was just being able to have a system, how to have a schedule. But as far as me learning, like what I'm learning in class, I was just like, mm. I and mean, I could be learning this, but it's like, I, I'd rather do something else or like do something I feel like would benefit me. So I, I just, yeah, we can go all down this, but definitely I just think the, the key takeaway is that there needs to be a revamp on just how the yeah. system is delivered, how the information is delivered, how the kids are interacted with, and just there needs to be really a diversity all across the board implemented. Yeah. And see, like what you're saying about like it being kind of like restructured, mm -hmm. I also... I, I feel like school is such a microcosm for society. Like you have, you have your hierarchy, you know, you have like your actual rank, like in school and you have like your social mm -hmm. hierarchy, mm -hmm. but then like you have the way that teachers treated you, like the people in power based yeah. on those things, like either thinking you're smart or thinking you're cool, which is super weird. It's so weird when teachers are like influenced by like, like cool kids. I think that that was so weird to see, you know what I yeah. mean? Cause that's like, a, it was a thing. Like I remember seeing, like I was, a, I was a kid who didn't talk a lot, but I watched everything. So I'm like, okay, you treat that kid differently than you treat this kid because he has a little bit more status, like a mm -hmm. football player who maybe had the best grades versus a football player who didn't have the best grades, but had a bigger network, a lot less leeway given to this guy, you know, versus that guy or take it away from football, like, or away from basketball, away from sports, like a kid who was in NHS, and did X, Y presidency, like was a leader in some type of student org versus a kid who just kind of did their own thing, maybe worked, treated differently. And I was like, why? Like, that's like those 
those are kids who have different vantage points, different viewpoints, but they're still students that have to be given the same level of respect. You know what I'm saying? Because they just have different things that motivate them and drive them. Mm -hmm. It's the beginning of our lives. We should all be treated like, like we've got something to give, you know? Yep. Like we're headed, <laughs> like we're headed somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, the reality is that that's not the case and that needs to change. Mm -hmm. all right so then after high school now you do an unconventional thing which is that you you decide to go to juco and that's where i meet you why juco why not go to university straight straight after high school what was into that decision because i think that's something that people are starting to do more so or there's those who believe that juco is less than or they're not really in the full college experience so just talk about that if you would i I loved junior college. I thought it was super fun because I, I mean, I was living at home, you know, and then like, I mean, I was, I was, I had student loans, but like that refund was so nice. And so I was like working for fun basically and like to <laughs> hang out and like, it's, I think it was really good to kind of like get my bearings at junior college before um, I left for school. But my main reason that I didn't go directly to like a four year college is because I didn't get into the colleges that I wanted to. Like, I got waitlisted for some places that I like wanted to go, mm -hmm. and then I got capped for UT. And I was like, so I could either cap and then like pay four year prices for one year, you know, and then like transfer. Mm -hmm. That's also like, I don't know. That was just so much change, and then to be uprooted again for another change. Like, I was like. I don't know if that's something that I'm interested in. And I wanted kind of some just stability. And then my friends were also living in the area. So I think I got just stability out of that. And I am so worth it, you know. Yeah, for sure. Figured out how to like study before it having so much impact on my life, you know. For sure. So what were the other schools that you were looking at getting into that, you know, you got waitlisted for, didn't get into? I got waitlisted at U Chicago, which is where I wanted to go. Mm. I didn't get into Pepperdine because mm. <laughs> I didn't realize until I was like right before I was applying that it was a Christian school. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> um, yeah. And like, I don't think my religion essay really knocked out of the park. Um, <laughs> I, I applied honestly to so many schools because I had waivers through my counselor. Mm -hmm. but, like, I honestly just had a lot of fun writing the essays. I was like, they were super fun prompts. And I was like, why would I? not submit this you know exactly um, but yeah I think my main school was um U Chicago and I also really wanted to go to Dartmouth mm. but I did not have the grades <laughs> I also because they also are a school that caters to indigenous people like their their goal was to like enroll indigenous people so that's where the mm. school was founded but mm. I didn't know my like native like affiliation at that time either like I wasn't super involved in my community and so like yeah. Bang. <laughs> Bang. And so, yeah, you do JUCO for two years, you get your bearings under you. Um, talk about some of the things that you were able to kind of find for yourself and how you were able to develop as a young adult while you were in that time. Yeah. Um, hmm. I think during that time, I kind of just got to know myself because especially hanging out with friends from high school and just I don't want to say like feeling different but kind of like realizing where you've outgrown you know and yeah. that, I think that was really um really reflective of the person that I was becoming mm -hmm. um I also oh my goodness yeah I had my first boyfriend during this time and I just like whew, realized what I don't like you know what I mean <laughs> and like that also just shapes you so much like right when you're you feel like you're an adult you make all these decisions mm -hmm. and then I don't know you just people are so weird I, I definitely I'm glad that I got my like little growing up yeah done yeah. near gotta, home you know we're like get I that had, done like, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly like, learning how to stand up for myself especially like like yeah with friends and stuff but with my parents Mm. So I learned how to set family boundaries. And I think that that also like carried into being able to set boundaries with just like people, you know, and having good fulfilling relationships with people, with my friends and stuff. And yeah, 
No. Especially as a pre-med also, like Sugarland Houston was really good for that. Um, it's all, yeah. It was also nice to be able to make friends that weren't my high school friends who I can visit when I go home, if that makes sense. For sure, for sure, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Not that. Network. Yeah, definitely. No, it seems like just kind of maturing as they talk about and really starting to develop your sense of self-identity was something that you were able to take away. And I think that's usually how the first couple of years of college are, you know, you kind of given a little bit of independence and, you know, you're, you have to figure out what you're going to do with it, right? Are you going to waste it and just, you know, make poor decisions? Or are you going to figure out, okay, this is what I used to do. This is something that has to change, or this is something about me that has to change. You know, it's kind of the same thing for myself as well. Okay. So then from JUCO, you transfer to UT Austin. So you get in. What was that experience like? Ooh, I actually transferred like in an off semester. So it was really weird. I transferred in the spring instead of fall. So not a huge transfer cohort. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, it was interesting. I, yeah, I'm really glad that I transferred. I really liked the people that I met. School was awesome. I, yeah, I was just gunning for change, I think, and also gave me an excuse to break up with my other boyfriend, my first boyfriend, <laughs> you know? Do you want to go into it a little further? I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding I'm just kidding but now so you, you get you moved to Austin you're on 6th street you're taking uh you're at UT Austin which is a really really great institution as far as education so uh talk about what it was like going to UT Austin and just sort of that education because there are certain people who have the perception like it's all school no play no socializing and then there are others who they say it's a party town and like hey it's just about getting turned up and then you do school on the side so what was it like for yourself that's so funny. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I partied a lot, I will say. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I really just did. I had so much, so much fun. And the thing is, like, I wasn't, like, I wasn't just partying. I was definitely getting stuff out of my classes. But mm -hmm. because of the way that you could, like, STEM classes were pre-recorded. So I didn't even have to, like, they didn't have a an attendance requirement. Mm. So I, for the first time, got to kind of schedule my kind of classes around my life, there which was go. really exciting. It was really cool because I, <laughs> I never went to class. But the thing is, that's, I don't learn best in a classroom setting. I really <laughs> don't. I like to be able to just like watch lectures and take notes in a place that I feel comfortable. Yeah. And the campus is so big that like I had classes that were, oh man. They were in the Burdine building, which was so far from me. And I hated walking there. It was like the little walk. Walk, the yeah. <laughs> and then, oh man, I was scared to ride my bike because of all the hills. And I was just, I couldn't do it. So yeah, I was like never in class. I was always just hanging out. And like, I had my little routine though. Like I would, for the classes that had attendance, I would go to them and then I would go to like the student center, the student activity center, and I would like do my notes and stuff for my other classes there mm. um, which was honestly it was really nice especially because after living at a dorm I moved to a co-op and that's like it was that I moved there specifically because it was rowdy and it had a reputation mm. and it was really fun I mean but I will say I am pretty I'm really good with boundaries and like discipline and like doing stuff because I wanted to do my school work it wasn't like I was moving there kind of with like the intent of it to distract me you know yeah so I tend to be like really focused for the most part and so it wasn't too hard of a change but like I moved there specifically because it was a party house basically and they threw parties all the time and it was really nice to be able to party and then go to sleep right there so it was just like a lot of safety like you know very practical yeah. reasons there you, there you go work hard <laughs> play harder and then once you're done playing you just you knock out right where you are it's all in one place exactly and I met the coolest people like I yeah especially since Austin is you know the capital and just really cool town really cool town really cool people very like weird and I I felt like for the first time I had like found people just like vibing at the same frequency you know <laughs> there you go yep got the same vibes the same energy and everybody's just on you know the same plane it's just like 
Yeah. Everyone months. was just weird. Everyone was so weird and like just subversive. And I loved it. It was great. Oh, no, that's great. So then you finish, you get your first degree and you get into your, your work and your projects, one of which you talked about being a dad and well, you got into other things. Actually, let's talk about your sex education and your sex work. Um, so you're a big advocate of, you know, people practicing safe sex, being aware. So where did that come from and how did that develop? Honestly, I it just kind of came from like growing up in Texas and Texas, the South generally, but Texas especially having just terrible sex education. I had been, um, when I was at UT, I was involved really heavily with like, Planned Parenthood um, and Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which I'm currently on the board of. Mm. So Planned Parenthood is like, what'd you say? No, it's good. Um, yeah, I'm just listening. So Planned Parenthood, yeah, obviously like sex education and stuff. And then when I was in SSDP, um, like the it, that was the first time I kind of thought about like sex and drugs kind of coming together and yeah of course people do that you know but thinking about that and how again like sex education what we got in seventh grade that one time like didn't cover any of this stuff any of the stuff that I had like learned yeah. while working and volunteering with Planned Parenthood um, talking to students on campus also gave me I think a really good grasp of what was missing and the differences across um just like different populations of people because we had our international students who would come and be like okay cool like we know what's going on because we got sex education in um, our home country <laughs> and then yeah. other people just like not knowing how to use condoms not knowing how to say no or like respect a no um yeah and then just especially studying sociology my sister's dog Oh. <laughs> sorry she's so What's cute yeah. <laughs> and so um like learning how so like the sociology of sex you know like what influences um oh McKinley by the way my camera is on okay <laughs> all right I'm just gonna put my head there. she's just I don't want to flash her okay Talk it. Talk it. um yeah but like just the sociology of sex like what influences to have sex how we do it um just especially being like a woman and people not really being taught to say how they feel, you know, yeah. and how detrimental that is to people's positive sexual experiences, especially in a place like Austin where people have sex for so many different reasons, you know, and having to like learn that it's, you know, not just for procreation, like this isn't, we're not just having like religious like biblical sex you know and like we're having queer sex we're not just doing like p and v like penetration like it's just so much more than that and yeah. i feel like just especially because everyone was getting me too for a while like just yeah. all these questions that people you would think they would implicitly understand but yeah they were never explicitly taught that like you have to respect someone's no or like all the different ways someone can say no to you and like I think that's also just a really important like anti-racist kind of thing mm -hmm. because they're just different power dynamics and different relationships and that's a huge part of like sociology you know like understanding those power dynamics and seeing how they impact people's lives and especially in one-on-one -on -one or like just like intimate situations like that mm -hmm. um power, dyna power dynamics and just all these grand societal kind of theories are really, really salient and obvious, and they just show up in the ways we don't expect. Yeah. Yeah. I Me, mean, who has a degree in public health, and I, so I went to U, U of H, which is also another diverse institution. So being able to see all the different, you know, sort of cultures, all different types of ethnic groups, all different types of people, one of the things I, I sort of found, uh, in my opinion, is just that. Um, like you said, us living here in the South, but it really just in the, in general, people think, well, it's taboo to talk about sex. So therefore, we're just going to avoid the conversation and that in avoiding the conversation, maybe we'll keep people safe. We'll keep young, young adults safer. What I found is it's the opposite, is that if you hide it, if you try to, you know, su uh, suppress it, 
people are curious and they're going to go try to find it out on their own. They're going to try to educate themselves on their own. And unfortunately, that leads to more mistakes being made. That leads to a big gap in the understanding and sort of the comprehension of sex. So for me, it's like, no, let's have a preventative approach. That's one of the biggest things I'm about is just let's prevent the problems by educating people and preparing them. And then from there, you know, people kind of can do with the information what they will. But at least now they have the tools to equip themselves with. Exactly. Yeah. Like a harm reduction approach. And that's honestly, that's the approach I take with sex education and um, like drug education, of course, um, and especially how they overlap as well. Like you need to just know all the information. You can apply it how you see fit, how it works for you and the people around you, of course. But <laughs> so, so out there in Austin, um, where you have been all types of tourists, all different types of people, it's a big school, a lot of different people. And just from you interacting with students and maybe even, uh, you know, teachers, administrators, what do you think is the biggest factors as far as the education gap or just in general, like people who you talk to, what are, what are you seeing the most or what were you seeing the most? I think the source of information was super important. It was just so all over the place. People just people just don't know what they don't know a lot of the time because there's no we have no basis for that. There's no regulated education even I mean I know that we were just talking about how education is so poorly regulated in the U.S. but like there, there's still not even like a solid um yeah there's no solid sex education and also we have like sex and drugs are so intertwined and the prohibition of both of them like the regulation of sex and drugs it happens at the same time all the time you know Yep. like the war on drugs and how that was even just like started by white men who were like drugs make black men think that they can fuck white women basically and it's like mm -hmm. that's so absurd like it's because there's just so tied they're so tied because of that and the way that stuff is regulated in the u.s because of its quote-unquote christian values which don't really seem to align with like everyone else's christian values but that's <sighs> not my, not my. <laughs> oh yeah. Start a start a gumbo. We why don't you want to start a gumbo? <laughs> no, but um, yeah, no, it, it is. I think you're you're correct in terms of like just the the way it's presented, the optics, and just the perception is one of outdated honestly way of seeing it and it's like no there's way more to it like I know um in the cannabis industry th this is something that's really having a big push is that like we've been taught so much from the youngest age you know I remember like red ribbon week in like elementary school of like cannabis and smoking is bad and can and weed is bad and then it's like now you look at it there are a lot of uh cannabis advocates especially in basketball players who are coming on like no it's actually not that bad it's actually there are some you know health benefits people need to do their research and i think it's the same with drugs the same with sex it's like just if you educate yourself then you're more equipped to understand really what's going on and then you're able to make more informed decisions but I, like you said you know the education system doesn't want us to talk about that because whatever the case may be and let's you know not too subversive it would be too it would just mess up the <clears throat> fabric of like so many things that our quote unquote society is built upon, you know? Facts, facts. Question so, one thing, question them all. Yeah, absolutely. So um, outside of your, uh, your advocacy for sex and uh, relationships, you also talked about your writing and then you've gotten into uh, NFTs before we get into your uh, edu engineering. So, you know, non-fundable -fund trade, uh, trades, right? That was called okay. NFTs tokens my bad so you know right now in 2021 we have this whole crypto world this investing world everybody's getting into that realm so what got you into that and uh why is it important to you to be honest i just feel like i've missed out on the last crypto wave i remember being like super young when bitcoin was still like ten dollars and i remember like asking my dad for money for it and he was like what is that like no you know yeah <laughs> like imagine if i bought some bitcoin at ten dollars a piece like oh my god stress <laughs> but like you know like i just i didn't want to miss out again and i also thought that it was really like just kind of interesting i never really had messed with um like smart contracts before and even, I mean, obviously it's still so new, but seeing all the applications, they're just so unexpected. I didn't realize. I recently was shopping for like sweaters for the winter to come out to Denver. Yeah. And um, I saw like this, the shop I usually go to to get like 
sustainable made clothing you know um they stock this wool like these sweaters from this wool company that uses blockchain and so they use blockchain technology for transparency um, so you can see every step in the supply chain and so you know exactly where your materials are coming from um, I thought that was such a cool application of that and I was like wow and just like I'm on Twitter, like tech Twitter, and people are always talking about NFTs, blah, 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 and you don't <laughs> want to miss the wave, so. <laughs> there you go. So you get on it while it's hot and while it's a thing instead of getting left behind, for sure. Yeah, yeah. need to do my research, and so I'm looking into all those things now because I'm not trying to be a person who says shoulda, coulda, woulda. I'd rather just do it <laughs> and be aware. Yeah. So now, sticking on the, the tech train, you also decide, so you, you finish uh, your time at UT, you get a degree in sociology, and then uh you become a data engineer so how did that come about and what has that been like and being in the tech space now it's been really interesting actually i work someplace that so right now so i work for like a like i'm a i guess i'm technically a contractor but mm. i work for like it's like an autistic employment agency basically mm. or not employment agency i don't know whatever i don't really know how to explain it <laughs> But like basically their product is that they hire autistic talent to like contract out. Mm -hmm. And so um, I contract now through them at Panasonic, which has been really cool. And the people there are like dying to be on the cutting edge. And it's so cool because coming from, especially I was working at a nonprofit clinic, they did not want to be on the cutting edge. They wanted to do things in a way that benefited them disproportionately, even when they didn't deserve it or work for it, <laughs> you know? And they just wanted to make money off of their clients, which was really messed up because again, it was a nonprofit. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And it was just, it's really cool for them to be like, no, we don't do that anymore. That's the old way. And the old way came out like a year ago. I think that's so refreshing. And yeah. the yeah. goal is to make, their services and understanding better and it doesn't serve some like other goal you know like it doesn't serve a personal goal in like a way that is detrimental to the team's work yeah and I, that's just so exciting for me <laughs> that's, <so much. laughs> uh, that's great it was really great that you were able to find something that really you're able to buy into you have a great interest in it, and you're still being able to do what you love which is to sort of just build on your skills and you know build on your go-getter mentality you know, it was really great. A lot of people, I think, lack something that drives them and, you know, pushes them to get up in the morning. And I think you being able to constantly find things to push yourself has only built you up into the person you are. It's one of my oh, favorite. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> a great episode so far. I mean, a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge, a lot of gems getting dropped. We're at the final stretch. So just uh, we're going to finish off with some quick hitters. So uh, start first off with your writing. So if you could write about one particular topic, what would it be? Actually, that's so funny because I've been like brainstorming because I haven't written anything that wasn't like research, you know, yeah. in a while because I've been writing articles for my blog and stuff. But I've been brainstorming like uh, a time travel, like sci-fi story mm. Mm. Um, about... Because you never see time travel with Black people because everyone's like, mm, Black people can't travel because blah, blah. That's not true, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to time travel to, like, Nazi Germany or, like, the United States at any point, but everybody, everywhere else wasn't like that, necessarily. Yeah. The U.S. has such a rigid, like, racial structure. Like, just, just discount the U.S. You don't need to travel in the U.S. back in time. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> or you have to travel, like, past colonial time, like, Go to the 1500s, yeah. 1400s. You're fine. It's fine. It's not <laughs> fine. It's not fine. This needs to change, and I demand. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah. So in stories, basically, it's gonna be about a black time traveler who she's gonna be a doctor because it's home. Um, and she's going go. to travel and find out like she's gonna do just like research into her personal history, like her family history. And she accidentally time travels and like gets to like meet these people. Oh, um, that's that's the goal. That's what I want to write about right now. All right, great. Nah, I'm really excited for that to come out. <laughs> All right. Um, so you who like to travel and like to see different places, if you could travel to three three destinations today, what would they be? Ooh, I think I'd want to go back to Hawaii. I loved Hawaii. It was so beautiful. Um, I. 
think I would also want to go to maybe like maybe like Ethiopia that sounds cool mm -hmm. and like see all the history and like their castles and stuff and then I think also I might want to go to Actually, I think Paris, but maybe that's just because I've been watching Emily in Paris. So <laughs> that piqued your interest a little bit, I think. Yeah, it's terrible. I love like watching shows about Americans being stupid in other countries and like <laughs> themselves. And she does that. Like she just like fights against French culture in Paris. And it's just so funny. Uh, all right. Last question. If you could drop your final gem to anybody listening, any young woman wanting to get into advocacy a young professional and a young man or woman what would it be learn as much as you can like whenever you have the capacity and you're interested in something like go hard learn everything you can about it like gamify it have so much fun like bring it into your other hobbies like it is just you're gonna have so much fun like live your life that's so exciting like follow your passions very good that's great and i agree so much all right that's a wrap for inside podcast we want to thank guest mallory colbert for coming on thank you so much great episode thanks obi thanks for having me <laughs> no problem you can catch this episode on all your listening pop platforms as well as youtube and the anchor.fm platform much love mm -hmm.